Sometimes a crime needs tough punishment, and in most countries that means a long stretch in the big house, especially for something like murder. Occasionally, these sentences can be absolutely massive and basically mean that someone is going to spend the rest of their life locked away so the rest of us can sleep a little easier. From the cop killer who did 39 years to the guy who served the longest ever sentence as an innocent man, here's 20 people who outlived insane prison sentences. <sighs> Number 20. Thomas Trantino. Thomas Trantino is an American who was found guilty of killing two police officers in Lodi, New Jersey back in 1963. He was sentenced to death for this. After the death penalty was abolished in the 1970s, he was given a sentence of life in prison instead of being given the chair. This was the start of a long fight for parole that went on until he finally did get out of prison in 2002. On August 26, 1963, following reports of trouble at the Angel Lounge on U.S. Route 46 in Lodi, Sergeant Peter Voto and P.O. Gary Tedesco were sent to check it out. Voto walked into the bar, leaving Tedesco behind, who was a probationary officer and couldn't carry a gun. As soon as Voto entered, Frank Falco and Thomas Trantino, who were there to celebrate a successful robbery, attacked him. When Voto didn't come back, Tedesco went into the bar where he was also caught off guard. Both of them were tortured and killed in the same brutal way. Falco was killed in Manhattan by officers of the New York City Police Department after they shot him when he tried to escape. After hiding for 66 hours, Trantino turned himself in at the East 22nd Street Station in Manhattan on August 28th. Then he was arrested. Trantino was let out of prison finally on February 11th of 2002, after being there for 38 years. At the time of his release, he was the longest serving prisoner in New Jersey. Before we go on, like this video, smash that subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Time for the rare topic. Back in the Soviet Union, punishments for crimes were brutal, usually hard labor until death by exhaustion. But in this case, a guy named Andre was considered lucky. The judge hit him with 87 years of jail, but no hard labor. The judge reportedly laughed, knowing that this was surely a life sentence for the young Russian, who was convicted of anti-communist activity. But Andre had the last laugh, when at 106 years old, he was released from prison having served his time. What do you think about his crime compared to the harsh sentence that he got? What will his life be like on the outside with all of the changes that took place over 87 years. As always, comment down below with the hashtag rare topic and let us know your opinion in relation to what we just showed on screen. Let's go on to the next one. Number 19. Ricky Jackson. Ricky Jackson was a teenager in Cleveland, Ohio when he was wrongly sentenced to death. In 1975, he was convicted of killing and robbing a money order salesman named Harold Franks. The only evidence against Ricky and his co-defendants, brothers Wiley and Ronnie Bridgman, was the false, forced testimony of a 13-year-old boy named Eddie Vernon, who would later be a key figure in getting the three men off. <laughs> None of them were linked to the crime by physical or forensic evidence. None of them had a criminal record before this. And witnesses for the defense gave all three of them good alibis. Still, all three of them were sentenced to death just a few months after they were caught. But their sentences were changed later to life without parole. 36 long years later, in 2011, Cleveland Scene Magazine took a detailed look at the case. It pointed out that young Eddie Vernon's testimony was inconsistent, and there was no other evidence linking Jackson, the Bridgmans, or anyone else to the crime. At the request of his pastor, Vernon changed his official story. Ricky Jackson and Wiley Bergman asked for a new trial in November of 2014, and Judge Richard McGongle agreed and threw out their convictions. The charges against both of them were then dropped and they were let go. But so much of their lives had been lost in such an unfair way. Number 18. Joe Ligon. 
The United States has held the world record for the most children sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole for many decades. And Pennsylvania has put more young people in prison for life than any state. Joe Ligon is the oldest juvenile lifer in the country and has been put in prison the longest, which is a pretty sad fact. The 83-year-old finally got out of prison in 2021 after being locked up for crimes he committed when he was just 15 years old. Ligon, the son of Alabama sharecroppers, was thrown in jail back when Dwight D. Eisenhower was president, and Nat King Cole's song Pretend was popular on the Billboard 100. Now the world that he lives in is changed beyond his comprehension. Ligon and four other black teenagers were involved in a series of robberies and stabbings that killed two people in Philadelphia in 1953. He admits that he stabbed someone that night, but he says that he didn't kill anyone, and he's changed in those long years. Ligon said that he's thinking about his future, and is thinking about getting a job cleaning the offices of the lawyers who helped him get out by using the cleaning skills he learned in prison. Number 17. Otis Johnson When Otis Johnson walks through Times Square in New York City, he's shocked by how many people are there. Everyone seems to be walking fast with blank faces and wires in their ears. And all of this is new to Johnson, as he hasn't had any contact with society since 1975 due to being in prison that whole time. Johnson worries he's living in a dystopia where everyone wears wires and is a secret agent. He's missed out on the whole Steve Jobs thing. He can't believe how many people walk around texting and not paying attention to where they're going. And he says Gatorade pretty much blew his mind. Johnson was released from prison in August of 2014 after serving 44 years for trying to kill a police officer. Johnson was given an ID, papers with his criminal history, $40, and two bus tickets when he got out of jail. Not many provisions to start life on what is basically an alien planet at this point. Number 16. Bette Smithy Nanny Betty Smithy killed a child on New Year's Day in 1963 and was given a life sentence without the chance of parole. She went into prison as a young woman, and in 2012, Smithy was released from prison, now walking with a cane due to her advanced age. Two previous governors had turned down her request for clemency, and she's been in prison longer than any other woman in the United States. She finally was given clemency by Governor Jan Brewer, and members of Arizona's parole board agreed that she was no longer the same woman who killed baby Sandra Gerberich in 1963. Smithy is what they call an old code lifer, and she got life in prison before 1973, and therefore, she needed a commutation from the governor to be able to get out. Since 1989, only three of these lifers have been given clemency. It comes almost 50 years after she was found guilty of killing Sandy Gerberich, one of four children she was taking care of as a 20-year-old live-in babysitter on New Year's Day in 1963. Number 15. Sheldry Top. Sheldry Top was only 17 years old when he killed a man and was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole in a county court in Michigan. At the time, John F. Kennedy was still the President of the United States. Sheldry got out of prison in 2019 after being locked up for more than 56 years. To celebrate, he went to a steak dinner with his brother. Before he was let out, Top was the oldest juvenile lifer in Michigan. Top never tried to change his conviction, but in 1987 and 2008, he was turned down for a shorter sentence. In 1962, Top was caught in Chicago less than two weeks after he broke into Charles Charles Davis' house and killed him with a knife. Davis was 50 years old. Courts show that Top had been in and out of mental hospitals since he was 12. He told police that he snuck out of a mental hospital in Pontiac, Michigan the day of the murder. Doctors had recently given him electroshock therapy and hydrotherapy, which is when a person is wrapped tightly in wet sheets and given electric shocks, all of which may have contributed to his mental state that fateful day that cost him and his victims so much. Number 14, Michael Hamline. One day, a biker named J.T. McGarry went missing from his home in Ventura County, California, back in November of 1978. A few days later, his body was found. He was shot more than once, and his body was left on the side of a frontage road about 25 to 30 miles from his home. Michael Hanline was arrested and later found guilty of killing J.T. Before Michael's trial, during which he protested his innocence, the district attorney's office asked the court for a secret hearing that Michael and his lawyer could not attend. 
happened. Under the guise of protecting an anonymous source, they got the court to agree that important police reports could be kept secret. At the beginning of the investigation, the reports showed that other people, not Michael, had admitted to committing the crime. But the police kept these reports from Michael's lawyer. Hanline's corrupt conviction was finally overturned after the California Innocence Project, and the Ventura County District's Attorney's Office did modern DNA testing and reopened the case. At the time of his release, Michael was the person who had been proven to be wrongfully locked up in California for the longest amount of time. Number 13. Warren John Nutter just before Christmas of 2021, an old man died at the Iowa State Penitentiary. Warren Jack Nutter, who was 84 years old when he died, spent most of his life in jail. He went to prison for 65 years because he killed a police officer in Independence, Ohio in 1956. He was the prisoner who spent the most time in jail in Iowa and was one of the longest serving prisoners in the whole country. Nutter had problems with the law as early as age 14. In January of 1956, he and some friends left their homes in Illinois and headed for California. They stole a car and robbed a store before being caught in Buchanan County. When they tried to get away, Nutter shot and killed a police officer. He was handed the death sentence, but the governor changed it to life in prison in 1957. In fact, his case was one of the things that led to Iowa getting rid of the death penalty in 1965. But he was no longer a threat to society by the time he died. He was just an old man in a new prison who'd given up after being locked up for so long. Number 12. Jesse Pomeroy in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Jesse Pomeroy was the youngest person ever found guilty of first-degree murder. In December of 1874, he was found guilty by a jury in the Supreme Judicial Court of Suffolk County. Also, he may have killed more than one person. Between 1871 and 1872, there's been claims that a number of young boys were lured to remote places and then attacked by an older child. But no one was ever put in jail. The attacks were important because the perpetrator was especially cruel and twisted. They hacked up the little boys with knives and bludgeoned them with kicks and a belt. Some of the kids were left with scars that would never go away. In 1872, Ruth, her two kids, and her husband moved to South Boston. Pomeroy kept attacking young boys until he was caught and sent to juvenile court, where his case was heard by a judge. Pomeroy was then found guilty and sent to the State Reform School for Boys in Westboro, Massachusetts. But later, Pomeroy was given the death penalty by hanging. His lawyer Charles Robinson asked for two exceptions that were both denied in February 1875. The governor still had to sign the death warrant and decide when Pomeroy would be put to death. Governor William Gaston, on the other hand, didn't want to give him the death penalty because Pomeroy was very young. He was instead sent to Bridgewater Hospital for the Criminally Insane in 1929, when he was already an old man in bad health. On September 29th, 1932, he died there. Number 11. Susan Marie Mellon Susan Marie Mellon went to prison for 17 years for something that she didn't do. She was finally set free in 2014. Based on what one witness has claimed, Mellon planned and executed the death of a homeless man named Richard Daly. After her trial, she was given a life sentence without the chance of parole. Judge Mark Arnold of the Superior Court said that he thought the justice system had let her down. Arnold said that her lawyer failed to properly represent her, and that the woman who said she had heard Mellon confess to the crime was a habitual liar. Judge Mark Anthony of the Superior Court said, I believe she's innocent, and for that reason, I believe in this case the justice system failed. According to court documents obtained by the Associated Press, Junie Patty, the witness who said she heard Mellon confess to the murder, had a long history of giving false tips to the police. However, it was now 2006 and she had already passed away. And now it turns out we were able to find out that three gang members committed the crime. Mellon remarkably said that she doesn't hold any grudges against anyone, and she's just happy justice has finally been served at last. Number 10. Juan Rivera Juan A. Rivera Jr. is an American who was wrongfully convicted three times for the rape and murder of 11-year-old Holly Stalker in Waukegan, Illinois in 1992. 
he was found guilty twice based on a confession he said was forced on him. There was no proof that he was even at the scene of the crime. In 2015, Lake County, Illinois gave him a $20 million settlement for being wrongfully convicted. This was the largest settlement of its kind in the history of the United States. Semen from the crime scene was tested for DNA in 2004, and the results showed that Rivera was not the source. But the prosecution said that the stalker had been sexually active and that the sample of sperm came from when she had sex with another man with her consent. So based on this, Rivera was sent to prison for the third time. His conviction was finally thrown out by the Court of Appeals. The Double Jeopardy Clause stopped prosecutors from retrying Riviera because the court said there wasn't enough evidence to convict him the first time. So after 20 long years in prison, this innocent man was finally let out. Number 9. William Barnhouse William Barnhouse was arrested for raping a woman on April 21st of 1992 behind an empty building in Muncie, Indiana. He was found guilty in December of 1992. Shortly after the incident, the police found Barnhouse and had him stand next to three police cars and a number of officers so they could check his ID. The victim was also present and identified Barnhouse when police used flashlights to shine them in his face. Based on this flimsy information from a traumatized victim, Barnhouse was put in jail Barnhouse said that he was wrongly accused, but he was found guilty and given an 80-year prison sentence. In the end, Barnhouse wrote a letter from prison to the Innocence Project to ask for help. Working with the Wrongful Conviction Clinic in Indiana University, McKinney, the Innocence Project, asked for DNA testing of the sperm found on the victim's vaginal swabs and on her genes. The Office of the Delaware County Prosecutor agreed to the DNA testing. The sperm from the vaginal swabs and the sperm on the genes both had the same male DNA profile. But Barnhouse was not the source, so he was finally ruled out. Since he got out of prison, Barnhouse has been reunited with his family. Number 8. Timothy Bridges now we're going to look at another similar case, this time for Timothy Bridges. He went to prison for 25 years for a rape and a burglary that he didn't do. The short version is this happened because an FBI trained state hair analyst testified wrongly that his hair matched two hairs found at the crime scene. The burglary and attack on Modine Wise of North Charlotte happened between the afternoons of May 14th and May 15th, 1989. Her daughter-in-law found her badly hurt in her home on May 15th of 1989. The victim, who was elderly, sick, and blind, sadly died 13 months after the attack without giving a good description of her attacker. Even though the victim said she hadn't been raped, the doctor who treated her said there were bruises that were consistent with a rape. For a few months, no one knew who committed the terrible crime. Then, three informants, all who had criminal records, said that Bridges told them he did it. Bridges has always said that he was innocent. His defense was based on the words of a former fingerprint analyst for the State Bureau of Investigation. Not just one, but two state experts agreed that a bloody palm print found on the wall at the crime scene did not belong to Bridges, and the court decided that the original witnesses were lying, possibly to protect someone else. Since he finally Finally got out of jail, Bridges has been living with his family. He just got his driver's license for the first time, and his uncle helped him buy a car. But it will be a long road to truly put his life back together after this terrible injustice. Number 7. Anthony Sanborn Anthony H. Sanborn Jr., who was found guilty of killing 16-year-old Jessica Briggs in 1989 and spent 27 years in prison, was set free in 2016 because of a sudden deal made after almost five weeks of hearings. Sanborn's lawyers have said that he's innocent and that police and prosecutors got him convicted by lying, pressuring, and threatening witnesses. They also said that authorities intentionally withheld evidence that would have helped Sanborn's case. Briggs, who had been Sanborn's girlfriend when he was 16, was stabbed and slashed to death, and her body was dumped in Portland Harbor. Susan Briggs, Jessica Briggs' stepmother, saw it in the first row of courtroom 8 every day in the hearings and spoke briefly to reporters afterward. She said, We never had any doubt that he did it. I'm glad the verdict is still the same. He walked away. Even though that wasn't our main goal, he's still guilty of killing our daughter. The original case against Sanborn was based on rumors. There was no physical evidence linking him to the crime, and most of the witnesses were teenagers who lived a rough life on Portland streets, moving from apartment to apartment and partying, trying to avoid the police. This one remains a very controversial case, but he's a free man again, even though technically still guilty.
Number 6. Christopher Abernathy Christina Hickey, who was 15 years old at the time and lived in Park Forest, Illinois, went missing on October 3, 1984. She was walking home from her high school choir performance. The next day, her body was found behind a shopping mall. She had been raped and slashed with a knife. More than a year later, on November 30th of 1985, Christopher Abernathy, then 18 years old, was brought in for questioning after a friend, Alan Dennis, told police that Abernathy had admitting to killing Hickey a few months before. Abernathy, along with several hundred other teenagers, had been to Hickey's funeral. He was overheard saying that he had a gun in his car and planned to fire a salute after the funeral. At that time, the police checked out Abernathy, but they decided that the comment wasn't a big deal. Abernathy, who had dropped out of high school and was thought to have a learning disability, signed a confession after being questioned for more than 40 hours. There was no physical or forensic evidence that linked Abernathy to the crime. Tests that were supposed to show his sperm were negative. A the jury still found Abernathy guilty of first-degree murder, aggravated criminal sexual assault, and armed robbery on January 15th of 1987. Abernathy didn't get the death penalty because he was only 17 years old. Instead, he was given a life sentence without the chance of parole. Abernathy spent a lot of his life in prison for a crime that he did not do. But in 2017, new DNA evidence showed that he was innocent. He was finally set free. This is another case that raises questions about about police coercion in circumstances like these. Number 5. Randolph Arledge Randolph Arledge got out of prison in 2014 after spending years in jail for a crime that he didn't do, repeatedly stabbing a woman whose body was found on a dirt road in rural North Texas. Carolyn Armstrong was killed in 1984, and Arledge got 99 years in prison for it. But a state district judge in Corsicana, which is about 50 miles southeast of Dallas, agreed with prosecutors and Arledge's lawyers that he could no longer be considered guilty, because new DNA tests linked the crime to someone else. At the start of the hearing, Arledge had chains on his wrists and ankles. Later, two deputies took him into a back room and took the chains off. When Arledge got home, he gave his two kids a big hug. When he went to prison, his daughter was four years old and his son was seven. His children said that they never stopped believing in him and they didn't ever think that he was guilty. Number 4. David McCallum in another case from 2014, a judge overturned a murder charge that had put a Brooklyn man in jail for 28 years. The charge was based on weak evidence. When 16-year-old David McCallum went to jail for kidnapping and murder he didn't do, Ronald Reagan was still in office and a gallon of gas cost 89 cents. After years of fighting for his freedom, which was helped by the boxer Reuben Hurricane Carter, who was also wrongfully put in jail, McCallum was finally given a second chance at life. When Judge Matthew de Emick of the Brooklyn Supreme Court says, I will dismiss the indictments, McCallum put his head down on the table in front of him and didn't move while his lawyer Oscar Michelin rubbed his back. He obviously had a lot of emotion after spending all those years behind bars and finally being released. Lawyers for McCallum sent Thompson a letter saying that neither McCallum's DNA or handprints were found at the crime scene, and this important clue is what led to his freedom. Number 3. Joseph Sledge on September 6, 1976, the bodies of Aileen Davis, 57, and her mother Josephine Davis, 74, were found beaten and stabbed to death in their Elizabethtown, North Carolina home. Both were last seen alive the night before at 10.30 p.m. Even though a medical examiner said they died between 8 and 10 a.m., the blood was still wet when the police arrived at 5 p.m., which means they must have died later in the day. Both of the women had dresses pulled over their heads, and they'd been savage beaten and stabbed many times. There was blood all over the house, which suggests that the killer also bled as he moved from room to room. Police thought that it must be 34-year-old Joseph Sledge Jr., who just escaped from the nearby White Lake prison camp less than 24 hours earlier. There was no physical proof that linked Sledge to the crime. Even though he hadn't changed his shoes since he got out of jail, they were clean and didn't match the bloody shoe prints that were found at the scene. It took until 2015 when finally a three-judge panel of Superior Court judges ruled that Sledge was actually innocent. He was freed after spending more than 36 years in prison for these crimes. The state of North Carolina then gave Sledge $750,000 as payment for his unjust imprisonment. But that is not not nearly enough money and no amount of money could buy all of those lost years back. Number 2. Eddie Bolden 
A guy from Chicago who spent more than 20 years in prison for killing two men got out in 2016 after the charges were dramatically dropped. Edward Bolden's first steps as a free man were outside the Cook County Jail. He was given a life sentence for killing Irving Clayton, 23, and Derek Frazier, 24, in 1994. They were found dead in a car. The police say that it was a failed drug deal. Bolden was found guilty based on the testimony of one person who said he was the shooter. Frazier's brother was the witness, and he was also hurt in the shooting. But later, an investigator talked to three people who said on oath that they saw Bolden playing an arcade game in a restaurant at the time of the killings. At first, the prosecutors said they would try him again, and Bolden was being held on a $1 million bail. But then finally, realizing that this man had suffered a terrible injustice, the office of Cook County State Attorney suddenly said they would drop the case and the charges, and at last, Bolden was was free again. Bolden said, I knew freedom would come, I just didn't know when. I didn't think it would take 22 years, but I still have my life. Number 1. Glenn Ford Glenn Ford was found guilty of murder in 1984 and sent to Angolia prison. 30 years later, in March of 2014, he was finally cleared of all charges and released. Ford was born in Louisiana's Shreveport. He's the longest serving person on death row in the US who was cleared of all charges while still serving. The state of Louisiana did not pay him a single cent for being wrongfully convicted. Isidore Roseman, who was 58 years old, was found dead in his jewelry store on November 5th of 1983. Roseman was killed by a single gunshot to the back of his head. Multiple people at the trial said that Roseman's yard man, Glenn Ford, was near the store at the time of the murder. Ford was convicted and sentenced to death by the jury, even though there was no murder weapon or even any evidence from confidential informants to link him to the crime. Prosecutors were able to take advantage of the defense's lack of experience experience and use a preemptory challenge to keep African Americans off the jury. In 2000, the Louisiana Supreme Court held a hearing on Ford's claim that the prosecution had hidden evidence that could have shown two other men were responsible for the murder. And finally, they were forced to admit what they had gotten wrong and release Ford after so many years in one of the most notorious prisons in the United States. Do you think we should look into all old cases and make sure they're not wrongfully in prison? What's the best solution for dealing with serious criminals? Anyone else notice how old-fashioned racism got so many of these people accidentally put in here? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.